Welcome everyone, Abdul Rashid Jahaya, esports entrepreneur, instructor, content creator, and philanthropist. And welcome to another episode of Esports Academy. Esports Academy is proudly powered by the Mid-Continent Public Library, Level Up Arena, Unified, and the Varsity Esports Foundation. It is because of those organizations proudly poured back into the community, we're able to build, build another lesson and bring to you another lesson to specifically enrich the quality of life that you have within gaming. Today's lesson is how much is too much. There's a lot of debate about how much green time you should have, whether you're putting in too many hours or you're not putting in too many hours. But in today's lesson, we're going to explain the value of the amount of time you're putting into the game that you're practicing, as well as some of the, the negative uh, aspects that can come along with putting in too many hours of video games. And we're going to accomplish that through three videos. The first video is the effects of time limits in video games. The second video is how to balance video games and study in time. And the third one is how to overcome video game addictions. But before we get into those, to those, to those videos, I got to give you your homework assignment for, for, for this lesson. Today's homework assignment is I'm going to have you take your notebooks. So whether that is your Microsoft Word document, your Google document, or, or your notebook, and I'm going to have you guys write down how many hours a week are you currently playing video games? And once you write down that many, that answer to how many hours you're currently playing video games, I'd like you to then write down how many hours a week you're currently studying or preparing for, for school or work, and also how many hours a week you're currently exercising. And I'm having you write down those three numbers so that as we go through those lessons, you can, you can understand how you need to make a conscious effort to balance the amount of time you're playing with the amount of time you're studying and, and preparing for other professional activities, as well as exercising to make sure you're maintaining a, a quality health and quality lifestyle. So before, we, so before we hop into those videos, I'd like to, to explain to you uh, what the first video is going to be about. The first video, How to Balance Video Games, is going to give you five tips on how to balance your work and playtime. The second video is going to talk about the effects of time limits in video games and how they affect how you think in your mindset within video games. And then the third video is going to address addictions in video games and how to overcome them. So stay tuned as we hop into the very first video, which is how to balance video games. People play games to have fun. Well, some people might only play to get mad, but for the most part, the point of video games is to create an enjoyable experience. So maybe this is why so many people are opposed to the idea of time constraints in video games. The clock ticking down on you, the feeling that you're not going fast enough, the frantic soundtrack blasting in your ears. It's easy to see why this system could trouble some people. And although time limits can cause the player to feel a certain amount of stress, it's the stress that can lead to a different and more enjoyable experience. The most important thing to think about when looking at time limits is the mindset of the player in these situations. See, the most that a player has at stake when they fail is the loss of their precious time. But if you ask anyone what they felt when Sonic was about to drown, they would probably say that more was at stake than the few minutes it takes to redo the level. So let's take a look at how time in games affects the mindset of a player, for better or for worse, and how it can lead to having more fun in a game. First, let's take a look at the system used in an obscure little NES game called Super Mario Bros. And let's do a hypothetical here. Say your brother is being a butt and he tells you to keep him alive while he goes do stupid brother things. You want to kill him but oh no, you just got in permastar invincibility. Well don't fret because you can actually still die in two ways. You can fall into a bombless pit or you can do literally nothing and let time run out. Let's focus on the latter because it's in the title of the video. From a lore standpoint, you could think of it as Mario's urgency to rescue the princess from the lizard monarch thing before something bad happens to her. From a pseudo arcade standpoint, you could think of it as a regulation on the time a player can spend on one playthrough, while also rewarding you with points for going faster if that's your jam. But most importantly, it means you, the player, might go faster than you would without a time limit. Unless you're familiar with the game, you won't know when the level ends, prompting you to go as fast as you're willing, as though an invisible wall of death were approaching from behind. Compare that to the slower, time limitless style of Mega Man, where you have to stop, observe, and then act, instead of trying to rush to the end. 
Many of the 2D Mario games will actually play a little jingle to alert you to time running low and will even speed up the tempo of the soundtrack. As anyone who's loitered around on a level will tell you, these things serve as both a helpful reminder and a stress inducer. But even though this is all true, Mario timers tend to be pretty generous. Although Super Luigi Bros U is designed so that every level is fairly short with a pretty tight time limit to match. A great example of this countdown mechanic is from another Nintendo property, Wario Land 4. Each level is actually split into two parts, exploring until you find the frog pedestal, and then backtracking to the start. The first half is untimed and has some groovy tunes, but once you hit the frog, everything changes. Wario shouts hurry up! A giant timer appears on screen and it's already ticking down. The music goes haywire, the world shakes and shifts colors at random. If you wait till the end, good luck. It honestly feels like you're playing two different games, even though they take you through the very same level with similar challenges. All because of a timer. And speaking of timers changing the feel of a game, some games make sure they don't do that by having the entire game revolve around a constant timer, just like the shrinking hourglass that is mortality. Dead Rising has a time limit to complete the game, and it also has story events that can only be activated at certain times, making it nearly impossible to do everything there is in one playthrough. Perfectionists who take things at their own pace will be faced with vanishing opportunities. On the other hand, a speedy player might find themselves twiddling their thumbs waiting for the next thing to happen, but maybe that's the point. Frank West's profession as a reporter should be a good indicator that the news isn't able to portray the full story of what happens to William Met, and this comes across in the game as the player being unable to do everything without some prior knowledge or experience. This narration is lost in the sequels, but you get the idea. On the other side of the tone spectrum, Pikmin is a deceptively relaxing game that also has a shroud of impending doom hanging above your head the whole time. To start, there is this overarching limit of 30 in-game days in which Olimar has to get 30 ship parts. This is pretty clever game design as it makes the player believe that beating the game is as simple as collecting a part a day. And sure, yeah, that can work, but what if you miss a day? Suddenly you've got to work double hard the next day so that you can keep pace, but on the other hand, if you manage to get more than one part in a day, you get to breathe a sigh of relief for a little bit. Then within that, each day is hard capped at about 13 minutes in length. That's about six and a half hours of actual game time to essentially raise your army from nothing, locate and retrieve ship parts, and defeat every enemy and obstacle that stands in your way. This approach makes players strive to be efficient and rewards careful planning. The sequel, Pikmin 2, on the other hand, removes this 30 day limit and also freezes the clock while spelunking in dungeons which make up the bulk of the game. As a result, the game feels far less urgent, allowing for a more exploratory and slow experience. Whether this is better or not is up to personal preference as even the original's limitations still allow for plenty of time. But what I can objectively say is that the original's time limit makes the player, subconsciously, step out of their comfort zone in order to ensure that they can finish the game in time. Now, one of the biggest side effects of this kind of system is that it artificially gates your exploration of the game world. There just isn't enough time for you to explore without being pushed to the brink of time. This really incentivizes gaining a strong grasp of the map and having a handle on how you spend your time. A good example of this would be Chibi Robo. While you didn't necessarily have a timer, you did have a battery life, which ticked down whenever you did anything and the only way to replenish it was by finding an outlet which would effectively end your day. This unique form of a timer really emphasizes what I was talking about, as it encourages you to be aware of your surroundings and to make sure you knew the quickest way to an outlet. Plus it always has you second guessing whether or not you should explore a new area or play it safe. There's always the question of whether or not there's an outlet in the next area and if you should risk your battery life finding it. Now while the games I mentioned prior to this point like to have timers ever present within their games, most of the times games tend to time specific segments or missions. You see, time can be used to add suspense or difficulty to an otherwise simple task or to make an already difficult objective into a crazy difficult one. Take this mission from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. You have to find all the channel gaps. Simple enough, but it has a timer on it, and if it's your first attempt, you might have to retry a couple times because you can't finish it fast enough. The developers make the players feel as if the stakes are way higher than they actually are and create an experience that sticks out much more in the player's memory. These types of time elements in certain sections create an illusion that the players are pitted against a greater foe even if that's not truly the case. There's actually a bunch of quotes from the portal developers that help illustrate this mindset change in the player. So I've been talking about those time limits that have that sense of finality to it, whether it be the end of that life, the end of one of your tries, or just straight up the end of your game. But now I'm going to talk about those time limits that don't end everything and instead give you a gentle, gentle, very gentle nudge to hurry it up. 
When these games decide that you've been lingering around for too long for whatever reason, they send the physical manifestation of death to encourage you to get a move on. The best example of this that I can think of is Spelunky, where if you stay in any given level for more than two minutes, you'll notice the music slow down and get real spooky. And if you didn't take that as your cue to leave, then a friendly ghost hones in at your position to usher you to the exit, or your death, whatever comes first. But a big part of this type of system is that it can add a bigger challenge to the game, sometimes even with a bigger reward. Thrasher has this, as you can get much more points doing rad tricks while the coppers are on your tail. And I would say Persona and Reseteer, but being the crap out of mechanics is required for 100% completion. In fact, in Spelunky, if the ghost passes any gems, they turn super valuable, making it invaluable to dance around death in order to gain high scores. All in all, I feel that this is the best mechanic for people who really don't like time limits because it doesn't actually mean the end. It could come with some cool gameplay elements and teaches you that grinding is the devil. I don't really know if I made any convincing arguments, but time is ticking and it's time for this video to come to a close. Honestly, I f***ing hate time limits, but don't let that stop you from telling me your favorite implementation of time in video games. And while you're down there, be sure to take your time and like and subscribe. But before that, have a good day. Welcome back everyone. Hope you guys enjoyed those five tips and, and took some notes on ways to balance your work and play time. Uh, those are very important, and I want to make sure that you guys are constantly keeping in mind that the same amount of time and effort that you're putting into grinding out to become better within these games, you should make sure you're also putting that same effort into your professional and scholastic efforts as well, because as you're, if you're, as you're growing into your esports professional or professional gamer career, um, being well-rounded is equally as important as being well-skilled within a title. Moving forward, um, the next video that we're going to go through it covers the effects of time limits within games, which you'll notice in quite a few games is um, where the music actually speeds up or sounds more dangerous or you'll see a countdown on the screen for you to accomplish some sort of task or complete the level. Um, these can be positive encouragements to get better at the game, but can also be negative to your development as it adds stress to the experience that you're having within the game. But we're going to go through this next video to further explain the importance of those as well as the effects that it has on a mindset as a player. So stay tuned for this video on the effects of time limits within video games. As you can probably tell from my backdrop in my entire room, I am a fan of playing video games, but I have a pretty complicated relationship with video games, and I can illustrate that on something I like to call the work-play compulsion scale. So as you can see here, it looks like a teeter-totter, and if I had my priorities in order and acted in the way that I wanted to act on a daily basis, then I would work for a certain amount of hours and then play video games for a certain amount of hours, and I would be nicely placed in the middle. But unfortunately, I find myself slanted over onto the work side, and my work tends to bleed into the time that I would want to be gaming. However, this video isn't about my particular problem with video gaming, it's about the problems for the people on the other side of that teeter-totter, the people who find that video games start seeping into their work time, the time they should be studying or getting homework done. If you find yourself in that area and video games are a major distraction to getting your work done, then this video is for you, and I've got five tips to help you start pulling yourself more into that middle area. So tip number one, and I think this is probably the most important tip in the entire video, which is why it's going first, and it's to simply set up an environment for studying that is only for studying. Now, if you saw my video that summarized Marty Lobdell's Study Less, Study Smart lecture, you'll know that I talked about how environmental cues and the context of the situation we're in actually largely defines our behavior. One detail from the lecture that I didn't talk about in that video was a study done at the University of Hawaii, which actually looks like this, where researchers wanted to figure out if they could improve students' grades by changing their environment. So they did one simple thing. They told students to turn their desks around in their dorms towards one wall and put a sticky note labeled study area on the lamp next to their desk. The students were instructed to only use this desk for studying and everything else, all of their activities had to take place somewhere else. And what do you think happened? Well, in comparison to the control group of students who didn't do this, the students that did do it had an average of a 1.0 GPA increase. So the action item here for you should be pretty clear. Find an area that is different from your gaming area and do your studying there. For instance, the temptation to game out here, not that big. Likewise, the temptation to play games in the library or a coffee shop is probably gonna be a lot less than the temptation to play games in your living room or at your computer that has Steam installed. Tip number two is to increase the friction involved in getting into a video game. So the idea here is to increase the difficulty and the amount of steps involved into getting into a distracting activity and uh, basically make 
doing your work the more attractive option in that case. So one way you can do this is by actually creating a different account on your computer for work and only installing the programs you need for work on that computer. And you can also set up extensions like Stay Focused or programs like Focal Filter to reduce the amount of distracting web browsing you do as well. My third tip is to simply game after you're done working for the day. Use gaming as a reward. And this kind of goes back to the concept of high density fun that I talked about in last week's video. Use the anticipation of a long gaming session later on in the day as a motivator to get your work done more efficiently now. Tip number four is to play games that work well with your schedule. So if you're really busy and you have a lot of studying to do, then it might not be the best idea to get invested in a like 120 hour JRPG or a super long WoW raid. On the other hand, playing a few sessions of Smash Brothers with your friends is probably not going to suck up a whole ton of your time. So just be mindful of the real world commitments you have and select your games accordingly. And tip number five is my favorite tip because it's actually fun and it's to simply turn your life into a game. You can actually reduce the compulsion to play lots of video games if your life feels like a game game itself. And the best way to do this is to simply set goals that are specific and that you're actually stoked to achieve. Now, I do this on a page on my website called My Impossible List, which you can find linked down in the description, actually. And basically, I break my entire life down into different sections and set goals for each one. Every time I achieve a goal, I cross it off, but I also iterate on that goal and make something a little bit harder. So I'm essentially leveling up in every category. You can also use tools like Fitocracy or Habit RPG to actually track your habits and gain real stats and actually kind of play a real game while improving your life at the same time. So hopefully you'll find these five tips useful enough to take gaming from an unproductive distraction to a healthy habit. If you find that your own gaming habits are still really hard to break though, there's actually some online communities that I'd suggest you check out. And over on Reddit, there's one called Stop Gaming as well as No Wow. And there's also a site called QuitLol.com, which is specifically for people who play League of Legends, but I think it has some useful information. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to both some of the members in the College Info Geek Habit RPG Guild and some people over at the r slash get studying reddit. They both helped me flesh out the ideas for this video and I'll link to both of them in the companion blog post. So that's it for this video. If you've got any additional suggestions or experiences of your own for making gaming less of a distracting habit, then let me know down in the comments. Otherwise, I will see you in the next one. Welcome back class. I hope you guys enjoyed the video on the effects of time limits in video games and have grasped a better understanding as to why those timers and those soundtracks are implemented in games for the, for the positive sides as well as the negative sides. Um, and within our next video that we're, that we're going to cover, we're going to be talking about how to overcome addictions within video games. And this is a very important topic because although video games do, do a wonderful job of helping us escape reality, um, it can also help us disconnect from individuals. And most games are designed to foster healthy emotional relationships as well as create positive positive um, emotional experiences within these games, we want to make sure that, that we still gain a constant grasp in reality, as well as make sure that we're consuming these games within moderation so that we can continue to grow our healthy professional as well as uh, gaming lives. So please stay tuned. This video is going to cover how to overcome video game addictions. Hey everyone, Stefan here from ProjectLifeMastery.com and in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how to overcome video game addiction. Now, video game addiction is something that affects a lot of people, especially a lot of young people. It was something that really affected my life all throughout high school. Uh, in fact, to give you guys an idea, um, I used to spend literally from the moment that I woke up to the moment that I went to bed playing video games. I would play it all day, every day, uh, I was totally immersed in it. There were a lot of days during school where I would skip school to go home and play video games. And for me, it was a way to escape. And I think that's ultimately what I realized that pushed me over the edge to want to make the change and get away from it. Because the reality was, in my life at the time when I was in high school, um, I wasn't a popular kid. I didn't have very many friends. I was very shy. I was very insecure. And um, as a result of that, I would get picked on. You know, I'd get bullied from time to time. I moved to high schools quite a bit. And oftentimes when you're a weak target and you don't defend yourself, then you know, people will attack you even more because they know that you're not gonna fight back. And they just kind of see you as a target to elevate themselves, to elevate their own status and make themselves look cool. So for me, I was very unhappy with my life. I was very depressed. And so I used video games to escape because video games, is a different world, it's a different universe where you can be whoever you wanna be. It's like, you, you can start from scratch, you can create your own persona, uh, you can become very good at it, and you can meet your needs from significance, you can meet your needs through connection and meet friends and, and feel like you're important and unique, and you're somebody. 
And that's what, what it was for the case for me because I felt like a nobody in high school. I, I was insignificant to everybody else, but online, you know, because I spent so much time doing it, you know, I, I, I was the best. I remember certain games that I played where I literally was the best. Like, I was the guy that people looked up to. I was like, you know, you know, I take out everybody and I, you know, I, I was a part of different teams and whatnot. And I was very skilled, so I felt very confident. And I was meeting my needs in, in totally different ways. And so I was kind of living these two different worlds. There was real life, and then there was this fantasy world of online that didn't really exist, but it was just an illusion. And it was very detrimental for me, um, and it can be very negative to a lot of people because for me, what it was doing, it was, uh, uh, it was causing, uh, it was forcing me to escape the reality, the truth of my life. And instead of confronting my life, the problems and the depression and the issues that I had, I, I didn't face it. I would just kind of uh, distract myself. And as a result of that, I would become more antisocial, right? Because the more time you play video games, it's a very antisocial thing. You're just in front of the computer all day. Um, it was disconnecting me from real people, friendships. Um, it was just, it was just also a waste of time when I look at it as well, because I looked at the, the years that I spent playing video games in high school. I like, I look back and I'm like, man, what do I have to show for that? I got nothing to show for that. I, I spent so much time um, and, and my high school years is just a blur. It's like, you know, at the end of your life or 10 or 20 years, you're not gonna remember th these little video games and these little adventures and stuff that you went on that were so cool at the time. You're not building anything of any value. And I, I often think, man, if I spent that time, instead of playing video games, I actually spent it improving my body or my emotions or self-development or building a business, man, I would, I would be like worth tens of millions of dollars today if I had started that process. And the amount of time that I spent doing that and just replaced it with self-development. Um, so I often think about that and I can understand how it's a problem because video game companies, they're designed to uh, suck you in, right? They're, they're set up in a way that all your needs get met through these video games, and I, especially online games. Online games are crazy now. Um, it's like people date and meet each other and get married online. It, it's, it's like all your needs are being met online and you no longer need like the real world. In fact, with virtual reality, the way it is now and it, the way it's going, I'm actually very concerned about that because virtual reality, like imagine the future where it's like you don't need to live real life anymore because you could just put on a virtual headset and you can live however you want to live in this virtual world. You said, how do you overcome video game addiction? How did I overcome it? Well, to give you guys an idea, I, I overcame it when I was 17 years old. Uh, as I mentioned, it was like my life all throughout high school. All my friends you know, played video games. I had online friends. Uh, you know, Even when I went to school, to give you guys an idea, I would, on my breaks and lunch break, I'd play video games. In fact, I remember times my parents, my dad, they would try to like ban me from the computer and I would like, when everybody went to sleep or when my parents went to work, I would like sneak home from school or I would like get out of bed to go downstairs so I could play video games in the computer that we had. So it was a real, real big problem. How, how did I overcome it? Um, well, the way that you change anything in your life is by making a decision, a decision, a decision to change, where you decide that you know no more, you're gonna cut this off for good and you're gonna pursue whatever else instead. And oftentimes, in order for us to make these decisions in our life, you have to get to a certain point, uh, a point that I often call emotional threshold. Um, it's that point where you just get to a point where there's so much pain associated to the, 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 the previous behavior, which was video games, where you associate so much pain to that that you finally make a decision to change your life and get rid of it for good. You're no longer gonna look back, you're only gonna move forward. And for me, to be honest with you, what sparked that change uh, at, when I was 17 years old was a girl. Uh, when I was 17 years old, I was totally in love with this girl and I thought she was the one and uh, she broke my heart. I was devastated over this and uh, I was in a position where, looking at my life then, there was girls in school that I had a crush on, and I, I just didn't have any confidence to pursue them. There was, uh, you know, the, the cool guys that I'd see, the popular kids, and they would always, you know, 
have girlfriends and then friends and whatnot. And I looked at myself and I was like, I don't have any friends. And it was a very, you know, I was just very depressed and unhappy, but it took me finally looking in the mirror. And instead of escaping and trying to hide and distract myself, I looked myself dead in the mirror and I said, never again. This has to change and it will change right now no matter what. And I looked in the mirror and I made a decision that I will no longer ever again in my life settle. I will no longer settle for less than I can be. I'm no longer gonna settle for a life that I'm unhappy with. I'm no longer gonna settle being alone in my life, not having friends, being insecure, not having confidence, living this life. Because I thought what really pushed me over the edge when I realized, man, what's my life gonna be like in five years from now or 10 years from now if I continue down this path? You know, what's it gonna be like you know, I'm gonna get even more alone, even more isolated, even more unhappy with myself. And the stacking of that, that pain of facing the truth, and I believe, guys, the truth will set you free. You get to the truth, man, you can change anything in your life, but most people, they don't wanna face the truth because it hurts, it doesn't feel good, it feels uncomfortable, because you have to admit to yourself that you're not enough, you have to admit to yourself that, you know, you're not happy. But if you can get to the truth, you can confront that pain. That pain can drive you to make that decision to change. And it did for me. And when I made that decision, I got rid of my PlayStation at the time. I got rid of it, I sold it, got rid of all my games, I got rid of my TV. And I remember that I didn't get rid of the TV right away, but I just disconnected it. I was like, you know what, I'm gonna disconnect my TV. I played online games on my computer, so I played a lot of Diablo 2. I sold my accounts, I got rid of everything. And I made like a hundred bucks for this years that I spent building up these accounts and stuff. So I didn't really get much of a return for it, but I made that decision. And then oftentimes if you wanna break free of an addiction, you gotta replace it with an empowering alternative. And for me, what was that empowering alternative? It was self-development. And it was realizing that I could change. And I was very blessed, because at that time in my life, I got exposed to Tony Robbins and the whole self-help industry. And I realized that I could improve myself. I can be who I wanna be. I can be that popular guy in school. I could, I could be that guy that could date that beautiful girl. Um, I could be that person who's successful one day. And the sky's the limit. And I got obsessed with self-development. I replaced one addiction for another. My addiction to video games became my addiction to improve myself, to change my life. And specifically, because I got hurt by this girl and I went through a lot of pain with that, I realized I'm gonna make my focus improving myself and developing confidence and social skills and be able to date uh, attractive women in my life and, and to get a girlfriend. And so I got into that. And so I replaced all of that with this pursuit of self-development, of improving my confidence, social skills, dating skills. I remember at the time I discovered David D'Angelo. He had a great ebook called Double Your Dating. I read this book like 20 times. I kid you not, I printed out the ebook. I read it again and again, and I made total different changes. I went out and I started uh, approaching women and, and, and you know, went out to nightclubs when I was 19 years old and facing my fears and did public speaking classes and improv classes. I read hundreds of books. I, you know, doing morning rituals and writing out my affirmations every day. And my life changed. Um, you know, that was the beginning foundation of who I am today, now 30 years old. And I never looked back. Never looked back, guys. Now, has there been time since where I've played some video games? Yeah, I actually, I actually have a PS4. I don't play it much, to be honest with you guys. I got it more so because I enjoy now playing socially with friends. Like, I have friends over, for example. You can see my TV back there, but we'll play uh, like UFC or NBA 2K. Uh, but to be honest with you, um, I actually get bored <laughs> with a lot of video games today, um, especially these like, I used to love role playing games, but I get bored of them now because they're just such, it's such a process, man, to like, to, to finish a game. It's like the out, amount of hours you gotta put in is just insane. So there's some times where I play like an online game, like a, a cell phone game or something like that, but I don't use it as a distraction. I don't use it, uh, you know, I think you can have video games in your life, but I think if it becomes an addiction and a, a detrimental in your life, a distraction, and you can't stop, and it's 
destroying your life, it could be a very negative thing, but I think having some balance can actually be good. So how do you overcome it, guys? It's making that decision. It's getting to that point where you decide that con continuing playing video games is costing you in your life, and it's creating a lot of pain in your life, and coming to that truth and that realization and associating to the consequences of what this is costing you in your life. How is playing video games every day costing you your life? Well, I can tell you this much. Playing video games every day is costing you money. You're spending money on it, but also you're spending your time, which is worth a lot of money. In fact, you're spending time, which you could use to build a business, to make more money, to create the life that you really want. In fact, you know, oftentimes I call your TV or your video games your electronic income reducing machine because the more time you spend doing it, you're losing money. You're losing the potential of earning more money. So realizing that it's costing you money, you're wasting away valuable time that you could spend improving yourself, going on adventures, learning, uh, you know, having intimate relationships with real human beings. All these different things are incredibly valuable. Also, you know, it can link to depression and anxiety, stimulation overload. Um, realizing the negative consequences associating to it, getting to a point where you decide, you know what, never again, and you gotta make a real decision. The real decision has to be you got to get rid of it. You got to get it out of the house, sell it, do whatever you got to do. Give it to a friend, give it away, get rid of it. Sell your accounts, close it down, get banned, set up software so that it like disables you from even using it. And then again, you got to replace it. Replace it with something else. Because there's going to there's going to be times you're going to feel bored and you're going to or stressed or alone or depressed and you're gonna to wanna to go to that crux that you've used in the past, which is video games, to escape and to feel good. But you gotta have an alternative. The alternative, you gotta make a list. Maybe the list is I'm gonna read, I'm gonna watch a documentary, I'm, I'm gonna go for a run, I'm gonna to go to the gym, I'm gonna go for a walk, I'm gonna take a bath, I'm gonna get on the rebounder, I'm gonna watch a YouTube video, I'm gonna do something more empowering with my time to replace it. And guess what's gonna happen is now the time that you're spending are there positive, sustainable things that are gonna make you a better person in the process? And when you look back, like for me, I look back from 17 years old to 30 years old today, the time that I spent, I spent it wisely. And I am who I am today because of the last 13 years of my life, what I've done every day, the rituals, the books I've read, that's made me who I am. And I'm excited about you know what I'm doing today, what that's gonna to lead to another five or 10 or 20 years from now. So that's the, that's the game changer, guys. That's how you overcome it. That's what it worked for me. Uh, it's gotta come down to that decision. And you gotta start to realize the pain that it's causing in your life and associate to it. Create the alternative, associate pleasure to that process. And sure enough, you'll develop a new addiction. That new addiction will set you free and lead you down a path of a lot more enjoyment, fulfillment, less distraction. It's gonna force you to go through uncomfortable emotions that you don't, don't wanna face and confront, but by facing it, you're gonna become a better person in the process. So that's my strategy, that's my cure for overcoming video game addiction. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit the like button, hit the thumbs up button, I appreciate the support. Make sure that you subscribe for more videos. Leave a comment below, We'd love to hear what you think. And of course, guys, if you wanna change your life, check out some of the courses that I have available uh, to build an online business. I've got some, look at the description below. Uh, you know, Check out my Morning Ritual Mastery course, which will help you develop rituals in your life and help you set yourself up to win and improve yourself long, improve yourself long term. Uh, that's at morningritualmastery.com. So I'll have the links below in the description, guys, but you know, become addicted to improving yourself. That's a much better addiction to replace than video games. And it's gonna to lead to a much better life. So thank you guys for watching the video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. Welcome back everyone. I uh, hope you guys were able to receive some valuable content from the How to Overcome Video Game Addictions video. Uh, I wanna go back to our homework assignment for today. Uh, I had you guys write down on your note card, Google document, Word document, how many hours that you are playing video games within a week and then uh, write down how many hours you're studying as well as exercising. So I had you do that because I want you to be able to see on paper as well as in the chat um, how many indivi how individuals are weighing the amount of hours that they're grinding out in the game 
as well as how many hours that they're grinding out in the gym or within their studies. I mean, with that, I want I want to challenge you to create an even balance between the two of them. So over the next week, um, here's your challenge. I would like to, s to challenge you to make those numbers even. So the same amount of hours that you're applying to playing a video game, make that same amount of hours exercising as well as studying. So that when we come back to next week's class, I'm going to ask you guys how you feel within making that, EV that even and balancing out the scale. Because the, the entire goal outside of being a great esports athlete or esports professional is being a well-rounded great individual. So I want to make sure that we're not tilting that scale too far on one end and make sure that we're, that we're staying even. So before we hop off of this, of this week's class, I want to jump back and give a special thanks to our sponsors that brought this class to you, that being the Midcontinent Public Library, the Level Up Arena, Unified, as well as the Varsity Esports Foundation. Special thanks to them because without them we would not be here and we would not be able to connect. So thank you guys for joining us today, and I look forward to meeting with you guys next week. Have a good one.